guys and welcome back to my channel. In today's video I'm going to be going over the fifth episode in my series called Studying for Dental Hygiene where I go through every single subject that I had while I was in dental hygiene school and give you some fun facts, tips and tricks, and helpful hints along the way. In today's episode I'm going to be going over oral pathology. As usual, I have a binder for this subject. It was a dental hygiene course, the name of the course, and we had two separate courses for this class. So dental hygienists are preventative specialists. This is what we do. We like to prevent the problems before they occur. Something that we can do is an intra and extra oral exam where we make sure that nothing seems abnormal on the inside and in the outside of the head and neck area. Oral cancer is something that we take very seriously. It has about a 50% five year survival rate. There's been no significant decrease in decades. So whenever we're talking about pathology, we have to know the descriptive terminology to be able to correctly identify it. We have to know the history, the anatomic location, the distribution and definition, if they have any borders, the color, consistency, shape, the texture, the size, we have to measure everything. So these are just some of the different words that we would use to describe certain types of pathology. And of course I have my handy dandy note cards available so that I am able to go over and quiz myself on everything. So here are some examples of the different descriptive terminology that we would use and what it looks like. Like a pro. <laughs> Carcinoma is 10 times more common than sarcoma. Epithelium is 10 times more common than connective tissue. Another fun fact, breast, lung, prostate, and colorectal cancers are the most likely to metastasize to the jaws. Another important reason why we have to update patients' medical histories because if they've had something like this going on, we have to make sure that we are frequently checking their jaw. Malignant melanoma causes most deaths due to skin cancer. <laughs> so unfortunately, these are some oral conditions that can affect infants and children. Cleft lip is a huge one. Cleft lip occurs in about 1 in 900 births and it's more commonly found in Asian and Native American people. It also tends to be more severe in males than females. That is similar to a bifid uvula. This is more common in Asian or Native American person, about 1 in 250 people. Needle teeth. So these are teeth that are present at birth or teeth that erupt within 30 days of birth. It does occur in about 1 in 3,000 births. The most common natal teeth are the mandibular central incisors. So these two bottom front and center teeth on the mandible. The mandible is affected 10 times more often than the maxilla. <laughs> Dental anomalies. So these are actually really cool to look at too. So microdontia, they're just abnormally a little bit smaller teeth. It only occurs in about 1% of the population, but the example of this would be like a peg lateral. So you would see someone with like the lateral incisor, the tooth right next to the two front teeth would be a little bit smaller. Macrodontia, so the teeth are a little bit bigger than they typically would be. This actually looks like gemination. I was gonna say, okay. So this is gemination. This is actually less common than microdontia. An accessory cusp. This isn't, I would say, extremely random, but it is usually bilateral if it is going to happen. It's more common in Caucasians. It's very rare in Asians. These are some other really cool ones. So gemination can be a variation of different things. Twinning is one tooth bud, but they're right beside each other. They're actually two teeth. Fusion is when the crowns of the teeth are fused together, but the roots are still separate. So this is from two tooth buds who actually join together at the top. Supernumerary roots affect maybe 1% of Caucasians, but it's just basically a tooth has an extra 
extra root on it that normally doesn't have the extra root on it. An enamel pearl. This is pretty common in Asians, Malaysians, and American Indians, and it's seven times more common in the maxillary molars, which are the upper molars, and they usually locate on the mesial or distal of the root surface. Dilaceration. <laughs> so this is that root that is kind of kicked out to the side over 20 degrees. This is usually the result of some type of trauma or crowding. It's pretty common in the third molar area or even the maxillary lateral incisor areas. Really That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> Hypodontia is the congenital absence of six or less teeth because of just failure to develop. Some acquired defects in the teeth. So something caused this to happen, they were not just born this way. This is attrition. Whenever your teeth are coming together too tightly, if you're grinding or clenching, they will basically flatten out the teeth. Abrasion, so this is where caused by friction. So toothbrush abrasion is a huge one. You see all these little cutout divot marks where it looks kind of like a ditch. These V-shaped grooves are usually at the cervical area, which is where the crown of the tooth and the root of the tooth meet. And then you have erosion, which is caused by acid exposure, by several different types of things. It can even be health conditions such as GERD or bulimia. It could be from drugs. It could be carbonated beverages. It could be sports drinks. Sorry, really That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> So this is just an example of some plaques, some calculus, some gingival recession. These are things that we see very, very often. Dehiscence and fenestration. Whenever you are studying this subject, just remember fenestration is the one that's a window. Thank me later. Sorry, really? That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> Pyogenic granuloma. So this is a pregnancy tumor. It only happens at about 1% of pregnancies. This usually occurs very rapidly and typically in patients who have poor oral hygiene. It's this bright red fleshy soft nodule that looks glossy almost. It's usually asymptomatic but it can bleed really really easy even after just like very minor manipulation. If this happens just let your dentist know. They might refer you to have it removed with Lugodiratins but normally they will delay the excision until after childbirth. Sorry, really? That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> So certain medications, especially seizure medications, can cause overgrowth of the gingiva. So this is also something to definitely keep in mind because it does not make it very easy for you to be able to take care of your teeth. If this occurs, make sure that your dentist knows and if you can, let your doctor know and try to switch to a different type of medication. It occurs in about 25 to 50 percent of people who take Dilantin or Cyclosporine, which Cyclosporine is an organ transplant medication. So people who have had an organ transplant they need a medication to prevent rejection of that transplant. They need their body to be able to accept it. So that is also another really common reason why people will see this gingival overgrowth. Sorry, really? That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> Diabetic gingivitis. So yes, this is actually a thing. And the severity is actually dependent on the level of their blood glucose control. It affects about 7% of the US population, especially Hispanics, African Americans, and Pacific Islanders. So if this occurs, it usually is accompanied by dry mouth, bad breath, and also bone loss. Sorry, really? That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> So geographic tongue or benign migratory glossitis. This is a benign inflammatory condition that's characterized by irregular patches found on the dorsum of the tongue. So the front surface, as you can see, it looks just like little different islands on the tongue. Women and young adults are most frequently affected. It only happens in about 1% of the population. Usually there's not any symptoms associated with it, but Sometimes it can be irritated if you have spicy foods. Usually they appear suddenly and then they persist for years or months and then they can spontaneously disappear and then reoccur. Iron deficient anemia, so a bald burning tongue. Iron deficiency is the most common type of anemia and mostly it affects middle aged women and young teenagers. Something similar to this that can happen and have this similar appearance is like deficiencies in a vitamin b12 or folic acid it can be sore it can be painful it sometimes can burn this can make the lips really thin we might notice angular colitis we might notice other erosions in the mouth shortness of breath fatigue dizziness tingling in the extremities or even difficulty walking so if it gets this bad therapy should be directed towards 
correcting the underlying condition. And then after therapy, the appearance of the oral tissue will improve. Started really That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> So this is a pre-malignant lesion on the vermilion portion of the lip. So it's caused by excessive exposure to sunlight. Usually older, fair-skinned men who have outdoor occupations are the people who are the most prone to this. Up to 10% of these cases will develop into cancer. The angular colitis, so this is a pretty painful condition that happens at the corners of the mouth, so you can see how red and irritated it looks here. So this is commonly seen after the age of 50, normally in women indenture wearers. So this is usually some type of bacterial infection, either from pooling of saliva, frequent lip licking in the corners, vitamin supplementation, vitamin B in particular can definitely help with this. Really That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> so this is like the different swellings in the face. We have to be able to identify where the different swellings are and what muscle and nerves are going to be associated with it. Sorry, really That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> Fortase granules, these are just little sebaceous glands that are found within the oral mucosa. This can be found on your lips as well. It's really common. It's found in 80% of adults. The density is usually greater in men than it is in women. Linea alba is basically white line. That's pretty much what it means. It's usually like one to two millimeters wide. It extends horizontally. This is typically because of the response to the friction activity of the teeth. Whenever people are bruxing or clenching or sucking in their cheek, this is causing that trauma. By the way, neither of these are something to be concerned about. Leukoedema. So, leuko means white. So, this is a white area on the mucosa. The incidence of this tends to increase with age. 50% of these are going to be in African American children, and about 92% are going to be in African American adults. It's usually pretty faint, also usually bilateral, which means that it'll show up on both sides. No serious complications are associated with it. You don't need to do any treatment for it. Leukoplakia, again, leuko just means white. as a white patch that is found on the tissue that cannot be rubbed off. Anyone can be affected by this, but the majority of the time, it's people between the age of 45 and 65, typically men. So this is a protective response, protective reaction, I should say, against chronic irritants. So tobacco, alcohol, syphilis, vitamin deficiencies, chronic friction, UV rays, cannabis. They vary considerably in size, so it won't look the same in everybody, but in most cases, they are benign, about 80% of cases. The rest of them are pre-malignant or cancerous. I had to switch to my phone because my memory card is full, but this is really important for us and kind of difficult for us because 1-4% to of leukoplakias will progress to carcinoma within 20 years. So these are some tobacco associated lesions. This varies a little bit. It just depends on how you choose to use your tobacco. These are definitely the type of patients who I recommend doing all cancer screenings on, even at home on their own time. Sorry, really That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> So on the other end of leukoplakia, we have erythroplakia, and erythroplakia just means a red patch that cannot be characterized as anything else. Erythro just means red. So these are typically worse than leukoplakia, and they have a much higher chance of progressing into carcinoma. These are associated with tobacco and alcohol use. A red lesion is usually asymptomatic, usually occurs in Patients who are 55 years of age or older. The prevalence is usually higher in men than it is in women. Sorry, really That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> so here are some nodules. Um, this is tori, mandibular tori. Mandibular just means the bottom teeth. Tori are a normal abnormality. They are just a bony protuberance in the jaw. They are most frequently found in women. They are very hard growth, so it's not something that you can just push around and squish. They are pretty hereditary. Tori can also appear on the maxilla, so on the roof of the mouth as well. I actually have this on the roof of my mouth, and I didn't even know that it wasn't a thing found in everybody <laughs> until I was in dental hygiene school. Exostosis is a, another one. This can occur on the buccal and facial surfaces, or can appear on the lingual, so it can be on the cheek and lip side, or it can appear on the tongue side. These tend to increase slowly in size as you age, but they're usually asymptomatic. Sorry, really? That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> 
squamosal carcinoma. So this usually appears as a chronic non-healing ulcer. So just an ulcer that does not want to go away. It can be large, crediform, granular, red, raw. Their borders are usually pretty firm and raised and irregular, but sometimes they can be rolled as well. They can be anywhere in the mouth. It's usually from excessive use of alcohol and tobacco, and that heightens the suspicion for oral cancer when this is persistent and does not heal within 14 days. So if this occurs, you will need to go get a biopsy. Sorry, really That's true. Like a pro. <laughs> Hypertension. So it is not, at this point at least, something that we have to do as dental hygienists is take blood pressure on patients before treatment, but it is a high recommendation. High blood pressure is known as the silent killer. This is the typical protocol that you'd want to follow in someone who has hypertension whenever they are in your chair. If a patient is going to have a stroke, remember fast. Have them smile. Is one side drooping? A. Raise both arms. Is one drifting downward? S. Have them repeat simple sentences. Is it slurred or does it sound strange? And T. If those are occurring, it is time to call 911. Congenital heart defects will occur between weeks two and six in utero. At this point, there are no pre-medication requirements for a patient who has a heart murmur. For a patient who has asthma or COPD, regardless of which type it is, do not use any aerosols on this patient. So do not use an air polisher and do not use a cabotron. If you stuck around to the end of the video, you are in luck because I'm going to go over some of my final questions that I have in my classes so that way you can keep these in mind to study for your boards A good way to remember this is C and C, cementum concrescence. that was a helpful and informative. I hope that you learned at least something that you didn't know before. This was one of my favorite subjects. I love learning about oral pathology and I hope that you guys did too. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you let me know by hitting that thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss any of my videos. And as always, I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys!